Welcome, everyone. Uh, you probably know me already. I'm Cindy Wagman, president of The Good Partnership. And I've been doing these master classes once a month for probably seven or eight months now. And uh, it's a great opportunity for us to chat with you and learn more about what you're working on as an or uh, through your organization and to give you some valuable tips and tools and resources. And so today's masterclass is all about the so what. And I see a lot of organizations, especially in their elevator pitches, where they'll talk to they'll talk to people about their organization and they'll describe what they do, not what impact they want to have as an organization or that they do have as an organization. And if you've seen my posts or anything else uh, that we've done before, you know stories are really important in fundraising, but you have to back that up. And today's guest, Tanya Aruda, is an expert in backing that up. And she uh, helps organizations of all sizes, um, from nonprofits, government, and everything in between, in articulating their impact through logic models and evaluation to be able to really, um, to really be able to strongly articulate and prove uh, and tell that story of like how what you're doing here creates this, that, and the other so that you're doing this work. And that's probably a little bit woohoo, or not woohoo, but like vague, which is why Tanya's here because she's gonna clear that up a lot. But I wanted to have her because A, she's wonderful. I've seen her in action and she knows her stuff. And this is a problem I see a lot of organizations have. So, Tanya, I'll let you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, how you ended up doing this work. Okay. Um, so, hello, everybody. I saw one familiar name on there, <laughs> um, but it's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, I've been doing this kind of work for over 25 years now. I um, started with a focus on international development and local community development. Um, Oh man. All right. In developing countries and then move populations um, for a decade and uh, working with a not for profit. Um, and I'm just seeing it says my internet connection is unstable, Cindy. Yeah. So I'll just have to raise a finger if I'm cutting out. Yeah. Or you know what? I might, if it happens again, I'm going to turn off the live feed because that could affect it. Sounds good. Um, and then uh, for the past 15, 17 years, I've done this kind of work within uh, government. So I've sat in and I've worked on, I've been on boards, volunteer on boards of directors and so on. I'm also a donor to, uh, on a personal level to a number of not-for-profits and so on. So I've probably been in almost every position you can be in, except for the fundraising one um, in not-for-profits, as well as being a funder and an outcomes mapper and an evaluation framework person and a performance measurement person and so on. Um, so one of the pieces of um, what I do can be used as um, Cindy has talked about for your fundraising efforts and telling your so what story. I'm just going to talk about the multiple benefits because um, if you're also having this discussion with other board members, your CEO or so on, um, there are multiple reasons for doing this kind of work. So the most obvious one is the so what, the what difference is this making for whom and how does this contribute to the betterment of society overall. Um, in Canada, um, it is a requirement if you become a um, a charitable organization to articulate what benefit you are uh, generating for Canadian society. Um, but there are multiple other ones. Um, certainly when you're applying for funding uh, with organizations, either levels of government, foundations, and so on, uh, they want to see this kind of material. When I started doing this stuff in the early to mid 1990s, it was uh, a fairly new conversation happening and wasn't a requirement it was an innovation now you'll you'll see it's pretty much standard in most foundations work and in government work um, for accountability purposes it's there so you can say um, here's what we're doing and here's what we're achieving and we can um, provide evidence that we're achieving uh, what we're claiming to achieve 
Some of that's for your funders, some of that's for your board, some of that's for um, your larger community. There are a whole host of other benefits, um, but I'll stop with that. And I'm going to jump right in um, as the entry point to this thing called the logic model. It's also called a theory of change, um, and there are a number of other terms. It, it started in the social sciences and has expanded. There are many permeations of this, and um, the diagram I'm going to hold up is a linear one, which is not um, reflective of or comfortable to all organizations. Um, so I'm going to show you this one first and talk about it a little bit, and then I'll um, tell you about another one you can look at if um, how you present your material and how you tell your story resonates more for you. So, my low tech. <laughs> what you've got on your screen is a logic model. Um, if you, Cindy, you can still hear me okay? Yep, totally. Okay. So, if you downloaded the um, work, uh, the three pager that Cindy had sent out, you'll see this in there as well, just not in diagramic uh, format as a diagram. Um, and you can do that after this. It's a worksheet to help you work through it. Um, but basically, you can start from either end. You can start with your inputs, so what you're investing, um, what your, your space, your people, your programs, your services, and so on. Um, then you'll talk about um, those activities and what you're generating from it. And that's what Cindy was talking about where most people stop. So they'll say, we served 40 people bag lunches today, or we offered programming to 80 um, disadvantaged people. I'm gonna keep it generic for now. But we, we tend to stop there and not continue to tell the outcome story. So what changes occurred in the short term and what happened in the longer term? So usually the shorter term ones are changes in um, knowledge, in attitude, in understanding, um, which then will lead to changes in behavior. And those changes in behavior will change status and condition overall. Now, the further you move out, and as you move from um, this side uh, to the other side, your influence over those results will become um, softer, perhaps is the right word. There will be more external factors at play, and that's okay but it's important to tell this story and that you are one of those key contributors to achieving those longer term, larger societal results. Um, now, the way that it's read is an if-then sequence of events. If you have funding and if you have resources and people, then you will offer activities and services. If you offer those things, then people will start to uh, experience changes either in their life or at a societal level or what that looks like. If you have a change in knowledge or understanding, then you're more likely to change your, um, uh, your behavior. And if uh, your behavior is changing, your status or condition might change. Um, you can read it the other direction. And this is often how funders will read the story is they'll go to the far end over here and say, I have some larger societal changes that I expect to have occur, and here's what they are. And they want you to answer the how. So as they say, we, let's say, um, we want to enrich people's lives through arts, culture, and heritage. The question becomes how. And then you'll say, well, we are offering some services and programming that is changing people's behavior or changing the service paradigm or changing what's going on out there. Well, how are you doing that? Well, because we're extending knowledge or access or some of those kinds of things. How are you doing that? Well, through all of our activities and services. How are you getting those? Through our resources. So people will enter into this conversation at different points depending on where they're at. I'm gonna put it down. Um, there is another document and I can, um, uh, I'll see if I can post it, but it's called Splash Ripple. If you Google Splash Ripple, and I think it's either Australia or New Zealand, they've got a great diagram as well, where they say that a lot of this impact storytelling, the so what, is like the splash of a drop 
in water and then it ripples out. So your immediate impact will happen at that point and then it has reverberations. Um, uh, a lot of um, indigenous communities have used this much more circular model in terms of uh, how things interact and all of the various pieces at play. Um, usually at a beginner level, people just start with the simple diagram I was showing you just to keep this simple. Um, it can also turn into a tree where you've got at the bottom, here's our inputs, here's some of our activities. This activity will generate these results, this activity will generate these, and there's maybe a bit of overlap. So then it becomes more like a tree. Cool. So for those of you who are trying to picture what this looks like, um, I'm going to do a, uh, give you a very brief um, uh, example of walking through this logic model. Um, with a subject matter that doesn't apply to any of our work so that you can understand um, or uh, follow a little bit more about how this works. Awesome. And I've, I've used this in workshops before. Go ahead, Cindy. I was just going to say, before you do that, I'm really curious in the chat, if people can tell us on a scale of like one to 10, whereas one, you're like, oh my God, what did you just tell us? I'm like, this is nothing we're close to doing, whereas 10, you're like, oh yeah, we have that, and we rock it. Let us know for your organization what, where you are on that scale of, I guess, confidence, um, just so we kind of get a sense of, um, sense of how you're feeling. I mean, it's so, uh, we really try, <laughs> six, three, we really try not talk, like talk in very practical terms, but it can, this can be an overwhelming uh, discussion, but it's, it's not like these are, it's very logical. So, all right, we're seeing <laughs> oh, okay. a couple of people at twos and threes, mm, I'd say mostly like six or seven. Um, it's great already, fantastic. Yeah, now, okay, so now that I understand sort of how you're feeling about it. Okay, actually, yeah. Cindy, thanks for doing this because then I'm not going to give that example because it's uh, going back too much to, to the ABCs of it. It seems that people uh, have some basic information on it. Perfect. So, um, one more thing before you go on. Yes. Now, um, for your organization, so you kind of understand that you feel like we're, how good is your organization at articulating your own model? So, uh, same scale, like one is like, we kind of suck at this, but I know it's important. And 10 is like, oh yeah, oh, 15, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're getting a good range, five, okay. I just want to understand, oh, <laughs> you have five. <laughs> Three, four, fives. So we kind of see, and it's making a little sense, but I think everyone feels like they can improve um, in this minus five. Uh, we, everyone feels like they can improve. So I just wanted to understand where, where the group was at. Perfect. I'll let you continue. Sorry, Tanya. Thank you. Um, yeah. So when we're telling this story and, um, uh, Cindy and I've done an in-person workshop on this where we, um, had the same conversation. One of the key messages that, um, uh, Cindy has educated me on is when this is being used for fundraising or um, generating your donor base or um, capturing people's hearts and commitment to what you're doing. Um, it's not about converting them to your cause unless you have a social marketing campaign. There are exceptions where you're trying to social market people to um, uh, smoking cessation programs or so on. Um, Although probably your funder wants you because they already believe in smoking sensation, a cessation, but that's just an example. Otherwise, um, generally you're going to try and capture people who are already committed to your cause and you want them committed to your organization. And you want to maximize how much of what you tell resonates for them. So um, I know that Cindy had, uh, Cindy's given me a few examples of three organizations that um, could use a bit of support on this. One of them provides, uh, so I'm going to give the, um, the, the, the basic version of what they provide, and then let's talk about what those outcomes are. So one provides lunches to kids who would otherwise go without at school. Um, and uh, the next one is uh, um, families experiencing homelessness. 
with a shelter and a homelessness prevention program. And the last one is um, uh, an organization that uh, addresses the or bridges the gap to get moms support and connections through programs. Um, some of these um, descriptions already had a little bit more about outcomes in them, such as the brown bagging one. So they talked about nourishment to the body and giving a connection to the community through, through their mandate. If those things have touched you personally, if you're already committed to those subjects, you're probably already on board. If you're a funder who already wants to achieve those things, um, they, and it's, it's very straightforward, um, municipalities give money um, for, say, brown bag lunch programs in schools and so on, it, it might be enough for a certain segment. But for all the rest, you're missing talent trying to achieve. So um, I've got in that um, in that three pager uh, workbook um, worksheets that Cindy will send out to everybody. I've got some examples of things that you would be capturing. The biggest part of this is capture everything you possibly can, and you can edit stuff back. So for your inputs, you've got a budget, people, policies, or space. Um, that's usually pretty standard. You've got that defined. Um, uh, your board might talk about how to make those things happen. And then you start to describe your activities. So you might be um, having uh, programs, services, develop products, have projects, partnerships, and so on. It's the what we do or what we offer statement. Um, those you might still be working on defining them a little bit further or as they expand or contract. Um, but to move then to your um, outcomes, you do have to be clear on who your recipients are. And um, you can't define them unless you know who those are. So at the um, uh, earlier stages of the logic model, it's going to be the people that you are trying to reach out to and to serve. Um, so those could be um, uh, people from a certain uh, de social demographic background, and you can get more detailed in terms of perhaps age cohorts, income levels, occupation, education, um, uh, gendered, um, languages, ethnicity, and so on. You might talk about geography. You might identify them as clients, partners, volunteers, collaborators, agencies, donors, funders, and so on. That's a long list and it matters because they will all have different perceptions and expectations of what result you're trying to achieve. So let's talk about um, your um, uh, longer term outcomes that you're trying to tie to and who might care about those. And then you're going to connect the dots from what you're doing right now to those longer ones and you're going to fill in the spaces in between. I'm going to hold up another diagram. This one happens to be from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. And um, they have six uh, domains, or they call it their investment strategy, that they focus on. And they've already got all the language in there, and you can steal it from them. So this is what it looks like. If you need the visual cue to um, just do a Google search, so Ontario Trillium Foundation, and you'll find this diagram. Um, what's on there? quite possibly applies to everybody who's on this call. So they've got an active lifestyle component. They've got inclusive and engaged communities. They've got healthy and sustainable environment. They've got arts, culture, and heritage. Um, they've got uh, positive development of children and youth, and they have enhancement of economic well-being. There's lots of domains in there, and probably more than one um, is something you contribute to. They do have outcomes that they've listed underneath there of things that they would see happening um, in order to achieve their outcome. So you steal those words. I just uh, pulled up the Ontario um, uh, Poverty Reduction Strategy called Realizing Our Potential. Um, whatever jurisdiction you're in, um, most levels of government capture these kinds of words, go through if they write, if they do strategic business plans, if they're a foundation, go through their material. Um, and 
To filter for outcome words, remember you're always going to look for one of seven magic words. So just like as kids, we would get a newspaper at school and you would have to circle all the words related to a tree. Try this for your work. And even if you're a five or a six or a seven on this list in terms of experience and knowledge, it will hone your ability to do this. And then you can start to take work from other people and ask yourself if it matches what you're doing right now. So those, I call them the seven magic words. There's probably more, but they're the easiest ones to remember. Maybe there's eight. I have to read. I'm going to have to recount this because I've I'll count them when you go. <laughs> okay, here we go. Changes. These are the more immediate ones. Changes in awareness, knowledge, and you don't have to scribble these down fast. They'll be in the attachment. But uh, awareness, knowledge, attitude, changes in opinion, changes in motivation. I'm way over. Changes in aspirations, changes in values, changes in skills. And with the skills one, you start to move over into intermediate outcomes. Now you're talking um, changes in behavior, changes in practices, changes in policies, changes in decision making. And then at the furthest out one, you're going to see social, economic, civic, or environmental changes. That's way more than seven. The seven <laughs> was changes in just knowledge and understanding, was- attitudes, which changes behavior, and then larger conditions. It was eight, the first section. Oh, the first section was only eight. Okay. So if you've got those magic words, stick them on a poster on a wall or somewhere and use them at your board meetings. Use them when you're writing proposals. Use them when you're preparing communication documents. Use them when you're talking to people to say, are you experiencing any of these things as a result of the work we're doing? Um, you have your own assumptions and claims of what your organization is achieving. Write them down. What, are, what, what does that vision look like? What do you think those results look like? But then go and ask the people. So um, uh, when I worked in local community development, we had a whole range of programs, everything from pre-employment programs to collective kitchens to um, uh, uh, pre-employment programs and so on. And we had written proposals, we had mapped it all out, and then, and then we went and asked the actual people receiving the, the services. And a lot of them talked instead about social inclusion, about networks creating resources. The people who came to the collective kitchen said, yes, you know, there's some reminder of how I can, um, you know, create more nutritious meals on a very, very tight budget. Um, but I also met five people who can help me out with childcare, and I didn't know if I could trust them until we had done some stuff together. So um, for the level of complexity you're working on, those people will all have um, unique and distinct stories about what difference it's making. Those are called unintended consequences. That doesn't have to be a bad word, um, although you might have some, and that's how you um, achieve program improvement. Um, but there's that whole um, larger horizon of what you are achieving. Awesome. Can we, um, I'd love to put that, uh, like bring that to life, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think, Bethany, are you one who emailed about being in the hot seat? I, th- I don't have, my computer is basically like com- completely consumed. By- I, think, yeah, I am. Excellent. All right. So, um, hey, Hi. Um, <laughs> thanks for putting your video on. And then, hold on, I'm going to just change my view a little bit. Um, so, okay, I feel bad. All right. Um, so, Tanya, uh, you, so Bethany, I can't remember. I think you guys have the lunch program, right? No? <laughs> uh, that's okay. No. Nope. Program? So- uh, do you want me to describe it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Brown Bagging for Calgary's Kids is yeah. a local organization here in Calgary in, in Alberta. Uh, we provide lunches for 3,800 kids every day who go to school without enough to eat. We're 100% um, community funded, so no government funding. Um, and every lunch is made and delivered by a volunteer. Wow. All right, Tanya, you still there? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I heard a lot of great numbers, but their numbers still um, yeah. and very descriptive, which I'm sure you you know. Um, so, 
the so what? So I would start by saying, so what? Have you thought like, what's, why is it important to provide food for kids? Yeah. So a lot of the language that we use is around community and the value of community. Mm -hmm. um, so food and the lunches that we provide nourish a kid's body for sure. We all need healthy food, mm -hmm. but uh, the real impact that we see is beyond that actual uh, food. It's about uh, those kids knowing and understanding that their lunch was provided by people in their community who care about them and care about making sure that they have enough to eat. And it also is about what happens when we all have lunch. So lunch is a really social activity at school. Mm. You are the only fifth grader who doesn't have food at lunch. You are not eating with your friends. You're not sitting with your friends. Um, so having a lunch allows them to connect with their peers and allows them to connect with maybe adult, an adult in the school who cares about them. Yeah. Um, you can build a really trusting relationship with an adult who gives them food, which uh, can be a really powerful connection. Totally. Okay. I'm hearing so many things. And before I pass it back to Tanya, I want to ask, cause those are like kind of three separate, or I heard sort of a, a few separate logic models, right? Tanya, like I'm hearing, uh, so the one is the nourishing the body, which actually has its own long-term impacts mm -hmm. I think around you know a healthy relationship with food like there's so much there totally. one is uh that community aspect and the value of, of people supporting each other um yeah. and then the social activity but yeah. before we dive into one any one of those I'm really curious what of those resonates most with your donors and how do you know that uh the one that we use most with our donors mm -hmm. is probably physical food. I think people okay. connect on a really fundamental level with kids should have food. Right. Um, so like your dollar will one provide. To, totally. Yeah. And we actually use um, one dollar buys a lunch. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. a kid. Twenty dollars feeds a kid for a month. So we've yeah. got some really clean numbers. Um, yeah physical food. And I think because that's something that everyone can relate to, right? We've all missed a meal and been hungry. Um, and we don't, nobody wants that to happen. Yeah. For a child. So that's yeah. the language that's the most we are moving towards or trying to figure out how to build that broader story, um, around community, around connection, around social, um, uh, suitability and, and social learning. So okay. in a lot of those components. All right. Amazing. So I'm going to pass it back to Tanya to maybe work through some of that. But before I do, um, I definitely think this is a process you can get your donors involved in and hear from them, like what, which ones resonate more. Um, cause you definitely need that overarching story, uh, a narrative and then say, but all it takes is a dollar to provide that. So it's a sort of one, two, punch, if you will. So Tanya, um, I know you've, you've also looked into this a little bit. So what are your thoughts? Uh, hi, Bethany. I'm actually originally from Alberta, from Edmonton. So awesome. <laughs> I almost feel at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that was a, a good um, a description and that kind of some of the domains that you fall in. Um, so uh, one of the questions in terms of why are we telling the story can be about getting resources that are not a dollar figure. Mm -hmm. So volunteers are a critical success criteria, critical component of delivering your services. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes a so what, what's in it for them. Um, beyond just the ones who are motivated by the of course kids need to eat to learn. Um, so there is no um, harm. In fact, uh, it, of course you would build a logic model around the nutrition story mm -hmm. and um, what happens with that, whether it is um, healthy bodies feed the ability to learn, which then um, addresses disparities in um, the education process. And as a result of children being more ready to learn, they're going to have greater success in the school system, which will then enable them to engage longer term in the, in, in the world of employment. The um, poverty um, uh, 
breaking that complex chain of poverty has many factors and facets, but nutrition and hunger is well known to be one of the core pieces. And um, uh, there are certain things you can reference, like the determinants of health. Um, if you look at the Government of Canada's poverty reduction strategy, where they just finished doing consultations all over Canada and doing some work on it, that's one of the key pieces when we talk about health and ability to engage um, disease prevention, um, which is also about what we're putting in our bodies. So there is a lengthy narrative that you can tell about what difference it makes uh, beyond just the immediate obvious nature of, of having food in your system. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like that when you've, you've, um, you've got fairly well in hand. Um, the community piece and this feeling of being part of a community is actually a really core fundamental one as well of most poverty reduction strategies. Mm -hmm. And um, to spell that out a little bit further, so um, at some level, are you trying to change the awareness or understanding of um, what the realities are of poverty. Um, when we've worked in communities, some of this seems really self-evident to us, and you're going to be thinking, oh, it's, it's so obvious, it's not, right? So um, many, many families who might want to commit don't see uh, the immediate um, nature of the issue. They don't see the children um, as being that individual they've attached to. So if you're trying to change attitudes or understanding of some of those early stage pieces mm -hmm. in your logic model for that community, one, when you're talking about your volunteer base, um, you can uh, thread that one out further. So might there actually their behavior and engagement change? Um, might there be changes? I mean, it is known that there are uh, socio-demographic um, uh, realities associated with poverty mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of work going on right now about diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. um, what does it mean for people to understand what multi-generational poverty means and why it exists what does it mean for, to, for people to understand what the burden of learning a new language is right, um, right all of those other pieces is also their learning journey which is beyond the um, delivery of a meal. It's the conversations that they have while they're sitting next to the children. So claim that. Yeah, claim it fully. Um, another piece is this um, social inclusion piece, mm -hmm. which is um, the least tangible and possibly the um, most challenging piece to engage in mm -hmm. in this conversation. And that social inclusion piece from what I've heard you describe is different from the other brown bag lunches that I've heard of. I mean, lots and lots of municipalities across the country and throughout the United States, I know there's some people in the States, have brown bag lunches. Absolutely. So I might say, good for you, I'm glad you're doing that, but I'm already donating to three other charities and I know the city's taking care of it. So what's special about you? That social inclusion piece is dramatically different and it actually um, when you talk about complexity of, um, of the poverty journey um, that social inclusion piece is um, yeah it is is a really fundamental one to spell out so if you're talking about the children mm -hmm. you might talk about um, uh, what difference that's made for them to sit next to somebody and tell their stories. It might be your, a different target group, which is your volunteers and what the experience has been for them. This will also affect your programming and your advertising. If you write that logic model about what it'll be like for them, that's the story you'll tell them when you want to engage them in the process. And simply by asking the question, you put an idea in people's heads, right? So that's the whole so social science research paradigm is, are you asking a leading question when you ask a question? And the answer is yes, of course you do. And that's a good thing. So if you're asking your volunteers, as a result of this, did you learn something different about another culture? Have you learned, I don't know if you've got indigenous population, have you heard, uh, learned about the systemic history and what that's meant for you? 
Mm-hmm. And I'm asking you really big questions. You need yep. to of course, scale them back. Okay. But as soon as you ask that question, you introduce it into the conversation and you actually affect some of the outcomes you're trying to affect because you've been so blunt and forward about it. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's a few of the pieces. Um, there, uh, and yeah, as you enhance then your programming to go with that, you can continue to expand it. But it's pretty um, profound, the unique value proposition that you've got, and to attach it to a lot more than the lunch uh, program is there. So I'm just um, madly searching this pile. Here's the description again that I've got um, from your organization, and I assume this might be the elevator speech. And just think about how you could change that depending on who your audience is, given some of the things I've said. Brown bagging for Calgary's kids provides lunches to kids who would otherwise go without at school in our city, nourishing their bodies and giving them connection to their community. Right now, we're providing for 3,800 kids every day, and nearly every lunch is made and delivered by volunteer. So the nourishing bodies piece, there's so much you can talk about what that means. Not we're, we're nourishing their bodies, enabling them to be present and um, have the, uh, the brain health, the body health, you'll come up with better words, to yeah. be engaged learners. And because of that, they have better school outcomes, which benefits them in the long term. That doesn't have to be a really long sentence, but it's brought people on that journey. The community yeah. connection one, it's the same thing as you can expand on what that means and what it looks like in a very gentle way. I'm going to just going to up while well, you look, because I think this is so interesting because my school, uh, my son's school has a, a hot meal program. Yeah. Um, and we live in a very diverse uh, neighborhood where there are people from very different backgrounds, especially um, at different income levels. And uh, we're also dealing with, he's in grade one, but we're starting to deal with bullying. Mm -hmm. And a lot Mm -hmm. of kids bully around difference, right? Uh, And like if, I feel like the, the lunch program is sort of an equalizer so that you don't always see or can't always sort of touch that, the, the difference that kids experience in their home lives as much when they're at school. And I think that it, it helps not just build the understanding, but also reduce uh, things like bullying, at least in my son's yeah. school. Yeah. yeah, and when we start to talk about, you know, I was saying the stakeholder piece is, is too often left out of this logic model story, and it, it is what everything hinges on. So um, you do need to be specific. So if you're going to look for new funders or volunteers or whatever resources it is that the resource you're looking for, talk about some of those demographics. Do some of the boys in the classroom need male volunteers coming in and sitting next to them, mm-hmm. right? Um, is it somebody showing up in a, a job or, um, right, somebody that looks like them Mm -hmm. or not right so that you have that conversation of somebody who's very unlike you and you both learn from each other about what each other's worlds are like um yeah that's so cool how important is it that um, this information is um like researched so we don't have capacity like a lot of organizations to do a lot of our own research a lot of the data or anything that we really get back is anecdotal. How valuable is it for me to spend a whole ton of time going out and finding other research on the value of community inclusion and the long-term outcomes? Is that necessary? Um, or how do I, how can I build some of that in without um, putting out, really changing the way we do our programs? Yeah. So I'm going to uh, ask Tanya to focus specifically on the second part of that question, which is how do you build that in? Because It's great for you to find research, but as you said, that's like outside of what you're doing and, um, you know, there's, there's lots there, but what I'm really curious about, uh, Tanya, if you could talk about is how do you build in the capacity for evaluation within an organization without like adding tons of staff or resources or databases and all that other stuff? Like, how do you start just doing a couple of these things? Mm-hmm. Yes, that is always the next big question, <laughs> and um, and it, it doesn't have to be hard. <laughs> so um, there's a number of pieces to this. 
as you're grabbing um, uh, text, context, um, examples for your logic model, you're probably going to your municipal website, your provincial one, maybe your um, national one. You might look at what Australia and New Zealand are doing. You're just grabbing a few examples and just in your concept. As you're doing that, those documents are going to pop up. And you're going to start to create a one-pager of sources of other jurisdictions who are doing this work, who are promoting this work, who already take it as a given that this is an essential piece to achieve those long-term outcomes. They themselves provide some legitimacy and evidence in and of themselves. If you've got multiple levels of government, other countries, the UN, uh, Sustainability Index, whoever it is, um, already saying this, and you've chosen some texted words from them for your logic model, you've already got a document that says it is, it is the, there are scholars and academics and uh, funders and communities who clearly already understand that this is how it happens and this is why it matters. So that's the simplest one. Um, another one is to um, uh, really get specific on your um, intake forms, which again, we're not talking, um, you know, an eight page document. You're just talking about a, few, a handful of filters. So um, you can look at the Statistics Canada results for your community, or you might have some from your city. Grab data that somebody already has and then match your results to them. So we had um, uh, 40, 40 children in this program. Here are a few of their characteristics or demographics. Um, here are their ages, here's their classroom. Very, very simple information. You don't have to have the kids fill it out and it can be anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, the same with your volunteers. You can do it by observation and say, here's what I'm seeing. Um, visible minority, racialized uh, poverty are um, of deep concern and um, visible minorities will be evident to you when you're walking in the classroom, whether or not they, so an, a recent immigrant is defined as somebody who's been in Canada for less than 10 years. You may or may not know that, but you can tell if it, if the person is a visible minority who is going to have some um, built in structural challenges because of the way our society operates. So to capture some of that information um, uh, is a fairly simple thing. Um, I, the surveys are not, don't have to be a painful tool. You can use just Google uh, or a, a, the SurveyMonkey one I've heard is harder to use now than the Google one. But you just send it out to your volunteers and ask them five questions. But you can't ask them until you know what your logic model is, right? Mm -hmm. So once you've got that, you know, did you experience on a scale of one to ten, to what extent do you think you've um, uh, changed your understanding of X issue? Or you do a pre and post. So before they start, you say, what do you know about these subjects? And then three weeks later, two months later, you say, can you fill this form out again? And tell me as a result of being in this program, and suddenly you've got a, a direct metric of change that's happened. When you talk attribution, attribution means that you can attribute those changes to your work. The more there are external factors at play, the less that you um, are either held accountable for it or can influence it, but your influence is still consequential. So you can ask people, as a result of being engaged in this program, has X changed for you? Um, and do a pre and post or ask it in retrospect. Pre and post is more methodologically sound, but again, when you're trying to choose where you're going to put your resources and energy, have, have five questions. Um, Two more comments. One is on qualitative research. Everybody wants to go to numbers. Numbers are fine. Um, numbers will tell you some things. Um, but the open-ended questions are ones where you have conversations with people um, and you capture, I'm just going to stop there. Um, uh, qualitative research, when it's done at a university or um, some other um, environment like that, um, they will capture domains, certain themes that they want to hear what people are talking about, and then they'll do an analysis of it. 
You can do your own version of that by saying, I want to know about nutrition, community, and inclusion, or whatever those categories are, and just have open-ended conversations about those things with people and see what they say. Out of that, you can say the following themes arose. We talked to um, 20 people out of the 50 that we were working on with, uh, here are the themes that have arisen, um, and out of that, here are the learnings we've got, and here are the benefits we see we've achieved. Um, there's, there's no harm in that. And the last point is, um, there are lots and lots and lots of people doing master's degrees and PhDs who need a uh, thesis and <laughs> need research and need yeah. data and need evidence and will do it for you over a longer term horizon. Mm -hmm. So um, one that comes to mind is there's a master's in health promotion at the University of Alberta. I'm sorry, I don't know if there's something similar in Calgary. Yeah. They're doing research around this stuff. They um, were doing around the social inclusion piece at one point um, about 15 years ago. But there are um, many, many disciplines where people are willing to do that work for you. And they'll do all of it um, using... Um, uh, and they'll make sure that they're not uh, breaching freedom of information laws um, or those kinds of things. They will have the statistical validity. But you have to ask yourself why. So the big question becomes, we want to know, we want to measure somehow that we're achieving the things we're, we're now going to claim to be achieving. Who needs to know it and for what reason? So um, if you have a survey of the volunteers and they say, here's the changes, and you say, can we share that? Now you've got material for your brochures and for other stuff. Now you've got program improvement opportunities, material you can bring to your board. Now you've got um, information that you can use to say, who else are we missing? Now you can make them ambassadors for your program because they have a journey that they can tell about what they learn. So um, this evidence piece, um, is much more robustly required by some funders, but I don't think that's your cohort. For those of you listening in where that's a requirement, um, many of those, I'll go back to the Ontario, Ontario Trillium Foundation example, they already have work that they're doing and developing standardized indicators that you need to align with and capture data for. So there are some that are already doing it for you. I'm gonna hand it to you and you're gonna say how many of these match what I'm doing. Yeah. And from a fundraising perspective, I just want to pipe in, like, I think if you can show, so for example, um, and Tanya, I might ask you to pull up that sheet of paper, the, the logic model one. Um, if you can go just one step beyond your activities to start looking at outputs and immediate outcomes, and if you can quantify or qualify some of that, and then just tell the narrative for the rest. You don't necessarily need to prove that in 10 years from now, X number of your students are doing this, that, or the other because of your program. You can say, well, in this year, this was the difference it made for these students, and this is how we think of that model. So the so what you can still articulate, um, even with, without necessarily having the numbers to back that up. And I would say especially from a fundraising perspective, um, you want to be able to tell that long-term story and then back it up with those, those short-term examples, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, and from an accountability perspective, if that's a piece of it, that's the piece that is expected to be measured, yeah. um, is those immediate changes. Yeah. And like, I think you referenced before, like the further out you go in terms of time, the less control uh, of impact you have. And so what you can be responsible for as an organization, how are you best setting up people to see those long-term results and set them up in, in a way that it, those are expected outcomes, but uh, focus on measuring those, um, taking it beyond just the activities and number of bodies, but what's the short-term impact. Uh, so that you can then start to um, do the so what. Okay, so um, yeah, so they have a, um, so that they feel like part of a community. What does that mean? Even if you don't quantify that, um, quantify that right now. 
Uh, mm -hmm. but you can still tell that, that story. And I would say, especially with what you're doing, like you guys have a really solid, like, I feel good because I gave a dollar and I gave a kid a meal. Mm -hmm. if, um, in the major gift space, especially, you're going to want to inspire people with that bigger story of impact. Like what mm -hmm. is their $10,000 going to do? Um, it's not just about providing 10,000 more meals. Um, how can they change the game? How can they change the system with that? Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Tanya, do you have anything you want to add? You're looking a little frozen, or maybe that's my <laughs> computer. You there? Ah. Um, while we wait for that to unfreeze, I'm going to, so Rob, you asked um, the best way to share stories, and that is literally a whole other um, masterclass. Um, so, but I'll sort of quickly touch on that. And I know it looks like Tanya, you're on breathing a little bit. Um, so I would say that quotes and testimonials have their place, but I would always prefer a story that has a solid beginning, middle and end a before and after um, to showcase a journey and a problem that you solve. Um, and yeah, you can put those stories absolutely everywhere and anywhere, um, depending on what your organization is actively using. So I wouldn't say like join Twitter just to, to tell stories. If you're engaging with your audience in Twitter, use that to tell your stories. Um, volunteer recruitment for sure. I'd want to hear from volunteers. So um, one of the things, I don't know if I'm frozen or if it's Tanya. Can you guys hear me? Just let me know in the chat. Yep, uh, you okay. Um, so the, the, where was I going with that? Um, one of the things I love doing is asking people when they give for them to share a story or a reason why they're giving. Um, and you can use those like on social media as well and all that. So the story piece is kind of huge. Um, I can send a link to anyone interested. Um, we did a masterclass on storytelling before, um, but as much as possible, like in bringing it back into the framework of what we're talking about today with that longer term narrative, I would say like figure out what that short term output and outcome piece is short term outcomes. Tell a really compelling story about that. And then ask people to imagine what that, what's going to happen for that student now that he has these, this foundation, what is his next five years going to look like that they wouldn't have looked like before? Um, and so you can, you can do that, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's so much more around stories, uh, time for. All right. Uh, do you have anything you want to add, Tanya? Yeah. Um, I think just, uh, as a capstone perhaps piece for this, um, is there's a phrase that's used in almost every sector, which becomes a bit of their ultimate outcome, which is the phrase reaching the, their full potential. All right, I'm hearing cut out. Hold on. I'm gonna okay, can you say that one more time? Because it didn't come. Yeah, so yeah, it's this, this phrase, reaching our full potential. And so reaching a full potential, you'll see it uh, over lots of lo government loves to use this term. Um, but it works for virtually every sector. What does our full potential mean from an environmental perspective? What does children reaching their full potential mean um, when you're talking about a school program? What does reaching our full potential mean for a municipality in a rural uh, settings, very little exposure to art, mar, arts and cultural programming. Whatever it is, if you ask yourself that question, what does that mean? For the volunteers or for your board members, what does reaching their full potential mean? What is their motivation for being on the board? What is their motivation for volunteering? How are they reaching their own full potential by being committed to your organization? Because again, this is more than just dollars. Um, this is people. 
And, and so um, use that phrase if you're finding you're getting stuck and it will open up the conversation again. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just going to reiterate uh, one thing I said at the beginning, which is um, use, because we're talking about this in the context of, uh, of fundraising, I would say before you deep dive into any of those models from a fundraising perspective, there might be other reasons yeah, you want to do that is really start to talk to your donors and you can even test some of the logic before you go and prove the logic. Um, so that A, they're involved, they can give feedback, donors love to give feedback, um, and you get to understand what's important to them uh, and how they can, um, and how you can tell your story in a way that's gonna help you raise more money. Uh, without distorting uh, the work that you do. So uh, that's sort of my like fundraising hat. Uh, don't forget that this is a great opportunity to get people involved, build their buy-in and help understand. Like they're gonna tell you which is important to them and which is not. And that is like gold for a major donor because then you can go back and say, okay, well you told us this is important, so can you help fund it? Um, in a nicer way than that, but that's really what we do. <laughs> so, uh, there you go. All right, anyone else have any questions? Um, and Bethany, thank you so much for being in the hot seat. Um, Absolutely, my pleasure. Excellent. All right. Excellent, mind is full, I, that's awesome, Michael. All right, I'm gonna actually turn off our live stream, because I think that'll, um, yeah. Yes. All right. Let's see. Um, yeah, I'm gonna now that the live stream is done on my computer's um, working a little. I'm going to give you guys a um, uh, here we go. All right. I'm gonna send you guys the link for the worksheet Tanya was talking about. Hold on. I have to find it. All right, feel free. Yeah, Bethany, thank you again. That was awesome. Um, Tanya, do you have any final thoughts? Are you, for some reason, looks like you're muted. Let's see. Oh, there you go. There you are. Okay, sorry, it, it cut out. Okay, um, completely. Uh, there we go. Yeah, it's. Um, I think. Am I cut out or good? Now you're good. You were cut out again. Okay. The biggest challenge when I have these conversations with people is they go, "Wow, that was great." Oh boy, that's a lot of work. <laughs> And um, universally, I've found the easiest way to do this is get a group of your volunteers or board members in a room and um, get out stickies and say, here's a list of our states, here's the outcomes, so changes in knowledge or attitude or in behavior, and have them just write stuff on stickies. Yeah. Whoa. I don't know. All of a sudden, the connection is really not like it. Can you hear it? way to start. The, for some reason, the connection is not great. Um, can you hear me, Tanya? Can the rest of you guys hear me? I get, I'm getting a couple thumbs up. Um, okay. So, Tanya, when you, when you get back, but basically, uh, if I can, I'm not going to say exactly what she said because it was probably smarter than what I would have said, but are you back? You're back. I think you're back. No, you're frozen again. Um, dedicate some time, even at your next like board retreat uh, or something like that, and start to just map it out. Is that fair? Are you back, Tanya? Uh, take sticky notes and look at you know, and, and just literally ask the question, so what? 
Um, you know, that was the whole premise of today is, okay, we're doing this. Well, so what? Why is that important? Well, because this is important. Well, so what if that's important? Like, why is that important? And keep asking the so what until you start to see the long-term impact that your organization uh, will have to change the world. So yeah, write it on yellow stickies and yeah. sort it on flip charts. It's that simple, but you need a group. So you have some conversation happening and you're doing some brainstorming. Yeah. All right. Um, as we wrap up, I'm just looking for the link for that worksheet. Um, I know I have it somewhere. I just can't remember if it's in Dropbox or, um, oh, here we go. Uh, and I'm going to copy it. Here we go. So everyone, this is, um, I just put in the chat what Tanya has been referencing. Some of you might've already gotten it in your emails, but, um, this is sort of will help you work through some of these questions and when in doubt so what just ask it take it a little further amazing any other questions we're done the live stream if anyone um wants to ask questions that are not aired publicly you're very welcome bethany um we'll give people a chance but looks like that's it for today Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tanya, for being our guest. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone.